got some incense. <laughs> Want to uh, set some ritualistic intentions for our, our podcast today? Yeah, man. Um, good vibes, good energy. Uh, we like that in truth. We like that in harmony, in peace. To this conversation, to anyone listening in the future, and to the whole world at this moment. Yeah, yeah namaste. Beautiful. <laughs> Is that a certain scent? Um, it's just called like, uh, it's called seven chakra. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's Fitting. this, it's just like from a little shop in town. I think it's imported from India or um, nice. Pakistan or something. Yeah. India. I'm feeling it through the video, man. Shockers <laughs> are all lined. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't know how, um, how that's supposed to affect it, but. It's all about the intention, right? Yeah. Yeah, like intention, especially with psychedelic stuff, is yeah. so powerful. Like um, my my recent mushroom trip, I wrote down like three or four intentions and like not even kidding, the first 10 minutes of the trip itself, like boom, these intentions came like mm. to the forefront of my experience and uh like what else does that oh, oh. Uh, no i think you lost me we're good we're back oh, okay <laughs> would you say uh, what else does that yeah like what else is so instant and it's um just the work that it does you know like mm. you set an intention and it's like it would be like if you if you brought those same issues to like therapy or something. Yeah, it would take you like months and months to like maybe even get to the core of the issue. You know what I mean? You'd have to like dig and dig and dig. Whereas with like a psychedelic, if you just set that intention, it doesn't always happen. Like to be clear, but when it does, it's like immediate and it's unmistakable and it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's what happened to me. Yeah, man. I think that's one of the main purposes for psychedelics, at least for me and others, is that if you have a question, you might get an answer or answers to your mm -hmm. question. And uh, yeah, I think that's one of the most useful ways to go about the psychedelic experience is to go in with some kind of intention or question or some kind of purpose for doing it rather than just getting high, like actually using it to construct your life, you know, using it to actually uh, become a new or just see things differently. Uh, totally. 100%. I think that's the yeah. really the main purpose. I mean, there's a lot of different purposes for psychedelic substances and a lot of different psychedelic substances, but I think that one very overarching purpose of those things is to, to see things in a new light and to see your brain in a new light, essentially. Yep. Yep. And I think that's a good thing for like the smaller to medium doses that that's that's like kind of what that realm is for yeah um among many things like you said and then the other thing is like our world is getting like so much more increasingly stressful and like we're the world isn't necessarily more messed up than it has been in the past like if if you look at it objectively we're probably like better off than if we were born in the year like 582 AD. <laughs> yeah, totally. But on the flip side of that, we're exposed to way more about how messed up our world is than yeah. the average human was ever designed for. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's why of all the uses for psychedelics, that like kind of helping yourself heal is probably the most important thing for us in this time in history because like, stuff is so messed up and we're all just like broken and like we're all like fragile and hurt and like messed up beings. So we need to heal that. And like, as I've thought about it, you know, like people who experience psychedelics, we tend to like start to have like a more utopian uh, ideal of like what the world could be and like how the world could change if like more people tripped or more people had this experience. But like, the most like practical thing we can do to like create change is to like heal ourselves first. And so then once we do that, I feel like it can emanate to like our, um, our like close circle, you know? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then 
it's like uh it multiplies from there and yeah. it could even be generations from now you know what i mean like who knows this this conversation we're having who knows like it could be being watched 50 years from now we don't know and yeah. uh it could That's be true. still making an impact yeah yeah for sure yeah wow and it's the same it's the same essence 50 or 100 years from now i think unless we're different beings but if we're still human beings it's like you're the one that has to do the work here nobody's going to do it for you mm -hmm. and psychedelics i think are, are a way to show you that definitely there's other avenues but there's definitely um a wake-up call involved in large doses of psychedelics that mm -hmm. can show you that um you know you're the one you're player one here and you have to and if you do want to create that utopia you have to create that internal utopia and mm. from there yeah you just inspire others not even because you want to inspire others because it's like that's that's just the wavelength like you can see mm. somebody else's vibe and you want that that's like contagious you know like positive mm. energy is just naturally contagious yeah um so yeah man it's, it's like truth. a byproduct if you're just doing the thing that you're gonna do and then yeah. it has has like a, a positive effect yeah and yeah, it's man. hard to it's hard to always remember that you know like yeah it's kind of like uh with the youtube channel or you know music it's like you never know when somebody is actually like watching it or listening to the music and it's like having a huge uh positive impact and uh, unless they tell you but there's a lot of times where you just never know that that's what's happening and mm -hmm. uh, and but it's constantly happening and and it's all part of this cycle too because you know like we are inspired by people who you know came before us like terence mckenna and you know that just being like the first example i can think of but do who are like some of your og like i guess people who got you super stoked on the psychedelic world um number one is timothy leary number two terence mckenna alan watts ram das there's number five in there, but I can't think of somebody. Those are the top four. There's somebody nice. else in there. You yeah. know, I got some other people, but like those are the those are the top guys that I listen to. Especially Alan Watts. He's uh, mm -hmm. he's huge. Like he just like there's so much. Well, all four of those guys. Like there's so much that you can just dive into and listen to. Mm -hmm. Um. So yeah, I've had a lot of nights absolutely stoned, just in the darkness, just listening to those guys, and I realized yeah. the power of word of of mm. of well articulated word i realized mm. the power of you know these people saying this in a certain way that allows somehow my neurons to make a connection that if if somebody said it in another way or somebody else said it it wouldn't it wouldn't really compute you know like that i could like there's certain people that just they um they imbue truth and they just, you can just tell they're being authentic in their word. And those four guys, I could just tell I'm like, well, they, they know what's, they know what's up somehow the way that they put their words, they know what's going on. And all four of them were inspired by psychedelics. So I use that, you use them as an example among other people and other things as examples, but those are the top, you know, top four guys, uh, in my opinion, that did it for me. What about you? yeah that's awesome man i i totally agree with that like the the way that just hearing it said you're like oh wait you can actually say that like you can put that into words it's like yeah for a lot of people these um these things are so hard to talk about and also so personal that you figure that it's like it's just this it's this like feeling like this emotion that's kind of like in the depths of your intuition and it's hard to like grasp it really but then you hear someone like terrence or alan watts and they just like say it like they mm -hmm. just find the right string of words and it's like and then it reinforces that idea in your brain um like you said like in a way that just couldn't have been done yeah um honestly my list is almost exactly the same uh <laughs> <laughs> like when i uh first started like having experiences i was pretty much in the dark like my first big lsd experience i just didn't know anything you know it was like that was the experience that led me 
to like pursue all of these other uh, thinkers and stuff. Um, but yeah, pretty much immediately after that, it was, I heard Terrence McKenna's uh, DMT elf story. And then Alex Gray, even oh, yeah, though he's, he's yeah, even though he's known as an artist, he has like books and stuff. And uh, it was one of his books called Art Psalms. Um, and it's got just a bunch of his art, but it also has like poems and uh, and just words and things that articulate these deep states of consciousness, um, poetry, stuff like that. And then he also had a book called The Mission of Art. It's about like visionary art and uh so those were really big influences for me and alex gray especially just because you know i had the whole kundalini experience and he was the first person to like validate that in the real world for me with his artwork yeah exactly exactly was there a specific piece of art that validated it it was the um the picture of like a painter And they're like, they have the paintbrush in their hand. And then there's like this like beam of light coming out of their eyes. Oh, I know that one. I don't know the name of it, but I know that. Yeah. Yeah. It was that one. And then there's that also that other one where it's like wide, it's like a wide angle one. And it's like a a person like meditating, like sitting cross-legged and it's like mountains behind them and like a grid. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So, but mostly that painting one, because in the painting not only do you see like the chakras and like you see like the uh, the heart center kind of projecting onto the uh canvas let's see if i can find it yeah for sure i just put alex gray painting but that's not really gonna that's gonna yield just all of his paintings so yeah i don't know um maybe try alex gray um artist um oh i got it i think it's yeah. this one i don't know. I need to share my screen I'm going to turn on my fan real quick. This one? Uh, I actually, oh, okay, there it goes. Yep, that's the one. Hmm. So it is called painting. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, so if you if you see, um, there's a bunch of things going on. Who are these all, guys in the top right? Oh, um, it's like Albert Einstein. That does look like Einstein, and I'm not sure who the other ones are. They might be painters. Um, is that Terrence McKenna kind of on the top left? It looks like it. Is this a cutoff one? Because he's um, cut off. Can't cut off Terrence. Yeah, I feel like there's a little bit more to this painting, but that's the gist of it. Yeah. So there's Ooh, a few like things. That. Yeah, there's, there's a few things going on that all of this related to different experiences that I had, but like all kind of around the time of my opening of these energies one is like you can see the heart kind of center projecting i felt something similar to that where like my heart center and my uh solar plexus center were kind of like willing whatever for me it was like making music and like uh jamming like improvising Mm -hmm. and then you see the third eye projecting onto the canvas and it's like this whole like energy system is is involved in in creativity and i felt like that and you see this you see this vortex on the top of their head that's kind of like the the funnel where the cosmic energy is kind of being downloaded and Mm -hmm. um and i've i've felt an experience where i felt like my head kind of like spinning around and then sperm (laughs) yeah yeah it does (laughs) And then you see the um, the little godhead in the back, like that presence behind your head. Yeah. I've had experiences on mushrooms where I felt like I could also see through that angle of like a second, like a higher self, but it was like kind of behind my head and like looking forward. So all of these things in this painting just like validate all these experiences that I've had. And uh mm. So yeah, that's why Alex Gray was a, a huge like inspiration early yeah. on. He still is like he's the psychedelic artist. Literally, yeah. like the, oh, I'm just thinking of like what he's so he painted this. He painted himself painting, mm-hmm. but in a psychedelic way. This is like very meta, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is totally it's really wild. Yeah, oh, totally. Damn. 
That's pretty cool. Yeah, man. So yeah, Alan Watts is also big for me. Um, I I need to reread him, man, because there's so many things that like it's so dense and like full of amazing information that like there's no way that we can actually like uh, understand all of it in like the first sitting. You know what I mean? Like, Come on, Alan. Yeah, Alan Watts. Because mm-hmm. it's oh, just sure. like so dense. Because I um, I read his book. Um, the Joyous Cosmology. Have you ever read that one? No, I've actually only yeah. listened to him. I, I've read one book called um, Become What You Are, but that's it. Yeah. I mo- mostly just listen to him online. Okay. Well, maybe you can find like audio of some of that. I don't know. But The Joyous Cosmology is his uh, book on psychedelics. And oh. um, yeah, it, it's awesome, man. And there's so many things that he said in that book that like I'm – coming back to later and being like wow like this was back in 1960 too like before all of the uh the 60s as we know it happened and here he is like nailing like nailing it on the head uh of like describing these experiences and like not just like the effects and like how it feels and stuff but like some of the deeper spiritual sides of it like um I just read a quote from him recently that said like he was looking at the patterns of like the hallucinations and that he felt like fundamentally that these patterns were coming from some kind of source that he called love play Mm. and that love means whatever it can possibly mean. You know how like love in the psychedelic sense is not just romantic, but it's like the whole spectrum um you know it's like just the only word we have to come yeah. close to describing what this like euphoric like caring uh energy is and uh yeah there's there was another quote that alan watts had where it was at the end of his cosmology book where he was describing a vision um i think he had on lsd and then he said that he was looking at what he felt was the heart of all hearts and mm. uh, I saw something like that on my mushroom trip. And because I had that like information in my mind of what Alan Watts said about it, I was like, I know right now I'm looking at the heart of all hearts. It was like a, a heart of the universe. It was like a hallucination in geometry, but it was also some kind of heart. Um, really interesting stuff. You mean heart as in like you had an hallucination and you felt an emotion or you literally saw a heart? It, so a little bit of both. It was it it was like a geometric visual, right? Like a hallucination. So it was like made of shapes, colors, and light, but it felt like it was at the center of something. Kind of like how you know the heart is like a metaphor for like you're in the heart of the city or you're in the heart of whatever. Body is in the center of us, right? And so this felt like it. It was like both an anatomical heart. Like it felt like it It was like, a, it didn't look like a heart though. Like the shape of one, it just, it looked like this geometric stuff. But I had the, just, you know, that sense you get when you're tripping and you like know something, you're like, this is the heart of like, this is like the heart of the universe or the some kind of like heart of my mind or consciousness. It's like the core, like yeah. the engine room of Uh, something Mm -hmm. so that's what it was yeah that's interesting wow yeah that was lsd you said that was mushrooms but i think of course when alan watts described it i think his was lsd that's pretty wild man that's the power of these things they show you the heart of hearts love greater than you could ever describe um some kind of guidance some kind of force that's behind Mm. the scenes that loves us more than we could ever imagine and uh, we're one with that. We are that love. We're part of that mm-hmm. force field whatever, of love, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, man, these things are illegal. <laughs> mm-hmm. these, things are, these things are schedule one substances. You know, they, like, to anyone that doesn't know any better, they think it's just like another drug experience. Mm-hmm. But it's not, man. These things are sacraments and they show us another way to view our being and our place here and show us really what love is or how love feels and just, you know, this is, this is a whole 
list of things that it shows you, but it's really just about, um, it's really just about love. And it's really just about, um, being able to live in that love. Like, how can you, mm -hmm. how can you take that, you know, that message that you got of the, the heart of hearts, uh, you know, the love that's inside of love, pretty much the center of the universe, the, the beating heart of everything. How do you take that? And you, you transport it here back into this real life, quote unquote, right? That's yeah. what I think is important. I think that's really another purpose of psychedelics is to make mm -hmm. us just be more loving. It's yeah. Really simple. And it, it did have that effect. Like uh, after I saw that, I was just feeling like way more like willing to give love to my friends. Yeah. You know, like I feel like. Uh, it's like, why not? Yeah. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of like weird conditioning that we have that has like kind of clogged that yep um like especially as like guys i feel like any sure. kind of affection or whatever is like you know perceived as being like gay or whatever it is and even if it's like you don't believe in that stuff there's like it's just kind of like a conditioning like leftover um you know it's like just leftover from way back you know like there's a lot of like weird stuff like that where and even if it's not you personally it's just like the general population or whatever that's that's just not the norm or whatever yep um oh, oh. lost me again i think there might be something wrong with my cord okay all right well i'll just keep turning on whatever i can just whenever it turns <laughs> off i just turn it right back on yeah yeah man um so that's like one thing I think we're kind of conditioned. Um, I think that's changing though over time. For sure. Um, it's going to take time though. Time, yeah. It's going to take some generations for that conditioning to change because I think it's actually literally in our DNA too. Mm. So, I mean, you can't, it's hard, it's hard to change the DNA, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so. But psychedelics can be good um, deconditioning agents. They can at least give you that fresh perspective of like, looking at it again um mm -hmm. and yeah especially if you go into it with that intention like we were talking about this all kind of reminds me of my uh recent uh mushroom experience with um which i think you you like uh left a comment or something when uh so i think you heard about this one my my recent mushroom trip where i basically like wrote down my intentions and uh one of them was I wanted to connect with my voice mm. and then um, like, and by connect with my voice, I mean like just be my most authentic version of myself. And uh, that like finding my true voice in terms of my creative expression. Yeah. And then also finding my true voice in terms of like my actual voice. Because mm. there's been a lot of times where I like think too much about how I talk or whatever. And then I get like super tripped up in my head and then I'm like, do I have an accent? And like just <laughs> weird stuff like that. I'm like, what yeah. is my accent? Yeah. And then um, you can kind of get all in your head about stuff. And I had kind of built some of that up over time. And I feel like, uh, so yeah that's just something i wanted to like kind of double down on it's something i've been working on outside of the psychedelics but um i i really wanted to like see what the mushroom had to say about it basically mm. and then the other intention was i wanted to like get back into what the masculine energy is and like how does that express for me as an individual because um a lot of the psychedelics kind of show us uh, the feminine side of the universe, which is something that's very well needed. It's like the the caring and the compassion and the nurturing of ourselves and others and the creativity, you know, like the creation of life. This is all mm -hmm. like the feminine aspects that are revealed to us in psychedelics. And that's something that our world is like very much in need of. So it's something that I feel like I've been exploring and integrating for like the last 10 years so then i wanted to like loop back around and then now explore the other side of the coin um mm -hmm. and be like what is what is masculinity like because i feel like 
I've never uh, vibed with like just a straight up macho like stuff. Like, for example, um, I was at work and then uh, it was like all dudes in the kitchen, right? And I don't know if you've ever worked at a restaurant, but kitchen yeah. staff that, yeah, kitchens, you know, there can be some hound dogs, especially <laughs> yeah. if they're like deprived. And so there was like, <laughs> there was like a girl walking outside and then they were all just like drooling over it. And it's like, sure. Yeah. She's good looking, but it's like, I feel like there was like this weird pressure to be like, uh, like to show that you were a man even. Yeah. Yeah. And there's just like weird stuff like that. Or just like uh, the idea of like being um, like beating someone up or whatever, like all this yeah. just super traditional, mm -hmm. yeah, super traditional like macho stuff. I've never vibed with that, and so I'm like, but I feel like there is like some there's value in like the masculine. I just feel like it's been distorted, and sure. uh, so I wanted to like get in touch with that um, in the psychedelic space. So that was the other intention. And both of my intentions came up in the mushroom trip. And with the uh, masculine energy thing, it like just came up and then I saw like my dad. And then I realized that this was like an example of that in my life that um, it was like a perfect example that I could draw from. And, uh, and then the other thing I heard was like the mushroom spoke to me and then it said, protect what you love no matter what. And uh, that was a super powerful notion because I feel like it does like kind of give you a role to play. Like, uh, like being the like stronger side of the coin, I guess, like physically um which ironically what do we have to protect our uh loved ones from but other like aggressive men or whatever <laughs> but yeah, <right. laughs> that's another story but yeah. um but i love the idea of that because it's it, it it's also non like a non-gendered thing it's like even a mother yeah uses exactly. that masculine energy when their like kids are um threatened Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just thought that was a really great way to look at it. I don't think it totally encompasses like the like whole of what masculinity is, but it's a great like centerpiece and something to kind of like live by. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not like a 10 page manual. It's just like one thing that you can do. So I'm I'm wondering like how do I integrate that? I'm like should I learn karate or uh, <laughs> you know like jujitsu or whatever? Um, but I not think even there's... physically you can emotionally exactly. protect what you love. Exactly. Yeah, you read my mind, bro. So that's that's exactly correct. And um, and then the other thing that came up was the uh, the voice thing. And I was listening to some music during the trip, and uh, I was listening to a song called "I'm Not." by panda bear um and panda bear is one of the singers from animal collective and uh there are so many things from this song that like became a revelation you know how like when you listen to lyrics and you're in like the right state of mind it seems like it's a message like directly yeah. for you like yeah, where yeah. you needed that right then and there yeah like the, the artist made it in the studio for you it's tr mm -hmm. transmitting through time and space for you in that moment. Mm -hmm. I've had that feeling. It's very trippy. Yep. <laughs> yeah. That's what was happening, man. And like the song is called I'm Not. And then it's it's repeating that in, in, the, uh, in the vocal line. It's like, I'm not. And I felt like this stripping away of what I'm not is how you get to the true version of you you know i'm just talking about how like i'm overthinking stuff like do i have an accent like what's my normal voice and then you realize that if you just strip away the things that aren't serving your true voice or who you really are like you can get rid of all of the things that aren't you and then you'll naturally settle into what is you and yeah. you don't have to deliberate you don't yeah. have to like be a question 
yeah, you don't have to like do something on purpose or like act or think or behave a certain way. Mm-hmm. If you just strip away all the stuff that isn't serving your core and then you you will like settle into what is naturally you. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's something I realized before, but it was like really getting hammered home. And then the other thing uh, was that I felt this sense of like, Uh, a childlike play like that that is where kind of our root of creativity comes from is this sense of being childlike you know that that embodies a whole lot of qualities right like childlike you think of playfulness you think of like imagination running wild you Mm -hmm. think of like uh energy or whatever and uh so yeah i these things came up within the first like 20 minutes of my mushroom trip and i was like dang man i was like definitely crying and uh it was just a super powerful like cathartic thing and uh that was a few months ago so that was my most recent trip that's awesome yeah that's powerful man damn yeah yeah that's uh i don't even know what to say after that to be honest that's but that's <laughs> that's the power of mushrooms yeah if you really want to use them the right way they will show you things about your being but you have yeah. to get back to it like we started you have to go in with the right intention I think if you didn't go in with that intention, it probably wouldn't have been the same. But you, you laid the, the groundwork mm-hmm. and the foundation for you to have that experience. And it happened. It doesn't always happen, but I think a good exactly. amount of times, if you go in with the right groundwork and the right mindset as well, like the you know, set and setting, if you go in with that, um, you know, you'll probably make headway in your being. And, yeah. And like you said, you just, you kind of just realize what you're not, you peel the layers back and then you just naturally sink into what you are. And I think that's exactly. the purpose. That's what we're all trying to be, right? Because we're all conditioned into what we're not from our, you know, maybe some say past lives or our childhood, but we're, we're, we don't know who we are. <laughs> so psychedelics, they allow us to show us uh, glimpses of who we are by showing us what we're not in certain moments like you had. Because mm-hmm. that's what we want, man. We all just want to like find a uh, um, less inertia here, less suffering, right? We all just want to mm-hmm. find peace. So yeah, man, we got to legalize these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> it's starting to happen. Uh, yeah. They... I don't think it's, I don't think it's the key. Let me just say that. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's like everybody takes mushrooms and Kumbaya world peace. I think it's definitely going to be helpful. It will be helpful, but I don't think it's a hundred percent because I know plenty of people that have taken mushrooms for sure. I know plenty of people and they don't have insights like you have. Or like, mm. you know, I have, they just take it for the fun, you know, listen to some music and then just come back down. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think you have to, you have to go into it with a mature mindset in with an intentionality, like you said, um, that's, yeah. I think it's psychedelics are definitely important. Like they're, they're the key, but you need to, you need to approach the door yourself. Like you need to know where to find, how to find the door, where to go to the door. And what I mean by that is like your intention, like you need to, you need to, be able to approach the whole experience in the right way in order to, I guess you want to say, reap the benefits of the psychedelic experience. Yeah, no, that's a totally good point. And that's something that I guess we kind of learn after being uh, disillusioned after a while. Um, like, what do you mean? Well, there's just times where like uh, when you first take psychedelics and you think that it can be everyone takes these and it's kumbaya but then you slowly yeah, have experience that. right and then you have experiences where you're like oh you're still kind of an ass even though you <laughs> yeah. just like have long hair yeah and uh <laughs> yeah. and there's been a bunch of times like that where i'm like these are supposed to be the people that are like more connected compassionate or even enlightened and they're not and it's like I think it it totally boils down to like your own intention and stuff and they can be an amplifier for that. Um, Mm -hmm. For sure. And, but, but it's weird because it's like, you don't realize it until you see it. Um, And it's not like to say that we're better than anyone because of that. It's just kind of like, that's the situation or whatever. And like, uh, I don't know what ingredients lead someone like, to care about it versus like someone to be casual about it Mm -hmm. you know i would have to say a genuine curiosity to what you are like Mm -hmm. you already have that mindset of 
wanting to figure out what the hell is going on. Like you have to be in that psychedelic mindset even before the psychedelics, you know, like Mm -hmm. the, the whole, like what's going on here. You just have to be curious about yourself, genuinely curious about yourself. And then if you ask the right questions, you might get the right answers. But I think people don't ask the questions when they take these things. And Mm -hmm. I don't care. Like you said, I don't, I'm not, I'm not better than anybody. I'm not judging, but I've witnessed in my experience, plenty of people just going into it with no intentionality and there's nothing from it. It's really, it's just like a movie of the mind, (laughs) Mm. right? It's uh, so I think it's just like, you have to be, you have to be on that wavelength of self inquiry in some way. Like you have to have that um, just genuine um, questioning of yourself. And I think that will do a lot. You know, and then the mushrooms yeah. might, they might just be that, that catalyst for you to, to, you know, pursue a certain path or see yourself in a certain light that allows you to pursue a certain path or whatever. It's just like they're catalyst to change. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I think you're totally right. And like, that's one of those things where it's like, I kind of forgot that but when you say it out loud I'm like ah okay that makes sense and then <laughs> I, I look back and I'm like I was already on like a, a path of curiosity and that's what led me to that and then that was like the ultimate catalyst so yeah, yeah. That was spot on what I'm curious about what that was for you like what was like the pre-psychedelic stuff that kind of like led you down the rabbit hole well I did when I was a kid I always did martial arts so that probably did something with the chakras unknowingly like we did a lot of like yogic poses you know just they're, they're related yeah um, so i did that and then meditation just like basic pranayama meditation breathing meditation i wanted to take on just for mental health reasons just to like calm the mind you know just like 10 15 minutes a day but that became like habitual i, I did it every day and started to get really into meditation and uh cannabis as well if you want i don't know if you want to classify that as a psychedelic i definitely do i've had I some do pretty wild experiences from cannabis so um yeah i got i was smoking weed for probably a few years and then uh heard about these mushroom things and got into those and that was uh that was it from there that's what sent me off Mm -hmm. i actually was a fan of how i got just you know kind of like going going off a little bit here i got involved in psychedelics was i was always involved with history and a lot of reading i read this book called acid dreams which Mm -hmm. is about the 60s and that's where i heard about um, you know, uh, Timothy Leary and, and uh, Richard Alpert, aka mm-hmm. Ram Dass, and right. what happened in the 60s. And that got me curious about like, well, hmm, they led this whole like almost revolution in the in this 10 year period or tried to at least. Um, yeah. I'm going to figure out like what was what was behind that? What was behind it was uh-huh. psychedelics and acid. It was mainly LSD that they were talking about. So I was like, let me, you know, my natural curiosity, like I said, led me to uh trying to find some of this said lsd <laughs> yeah and uh yeah it was history from there man that's when i realized like well these guys are onto something um mm. yeah but what was your original question i forget it was like what led you down the rabbit hole like oh, before yeah. actually tripping yeah yeah it was just i mean i've always just genuine curiosity but what about what's going on here man and uh yeah like what the reasoning for stuff just and the stuff that happens in my life just like wanted to know why I'm here and who I am and where does that come from? I don't know. Some may say your past lives and our, our karma led me here, but just for some reason, just wanting to know like, what's up, man, because nobody knows mm-hmm. what's up. We all act like we got it figured out. We all act like we know what's going on. You know, we go to work Monday through Friday, nine to five, we come home on the weekend, watch Netflix, maybe go to the bar and that's our life. And you know, this is my life. This is who I am. Uh, but that's not who we are. Like what who we who we're told we are from our job title or you know, whatever else we do in life. That's not who we are. And I figured that out early. I don't know how. I figured out like this is not we're living in some kind of weird illusion. Everybody is like living in this facade of um reality. And somehow, some way, I just wanted to keep figuring out um who I am. Not that I I have no, I still don't know who I am. The more I go into that journey, the more I realize I have no clue who I am, but mm-hmm. I'm still, I think it's the question that matters. And if you stay on that wavelength of curiosity, um, like a genuine earnest curiosity of who you are, I think it just, for me, it leads to less, uh, less inertia in my life. I don't know why mm. there's just like, I, I feel like that's what life's all about. 
I don't know. I think that's what the purpose of being here right now. It's to figure out what the hell's going on because nobody knows what's going on. It's the mystery of life. I'm trying to figure it out, right? I think, I don't know if it's even to be solved, but at least I, I think if you want to say there's a goal to life, it's to know thyself, <laughs> right? It's the go. oldest one in the book. It's to, uh, to know who you are, man. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know how I got on that wavelength, to be honest with you, bro, but I'm here now and I don't think I'm going back, <laughs> yeah. right? There's no going back once you get on that yeah no that's awesome man super cool yeah uh what about you yeah it was um it was kind of similar man it for me it it was all tied in with music um you know I've, I've been playing guitar for more than half of my life and been playing in a band for almost just as long and uh there was uh, when I was 14, I had a vision. Um, okay, let me scoot back a little bit. The thing that I first noticed w was actually in states of mind between waking and sleeping. Oh, yeah. It was okay. like I would be falling asleep listening to something. And when I was 12 and 13, I listened to Jimi Hendrix because, you know, he's like the guitar god and everything. But he's also a very psychedelic artist. And so I was listening to Jimi Hendrix as like a 12 year old and like in this nether realm between being awake and asleep. And like these songs by Jimi Hendrix were like creating this like 3D like world in my mind, um, you mm. know, through the music. And uh, I didn't realize it then, but that was very a very psychedelic experience. For sure. And that would happen to me a lot where I would be listening to stuff at night and then right before you fall asleep, it's like your ego is quiet and then you get to be subsumed into this like larger thing, which, you know, is the music. And uh, that would happen to me listening to like the Mars Volta as well. And they're also very psychedelic at times. And, um, and then there was a time where I was listening to a band uh, called the fall of Troy that are not considered psychedelic, but they do. Uh, I later found out that the song I was listening to was written on mushrooms. So that I feel <laughs> like that's some weird connection. Cause I was like in this half awake state. And then I saw like a 3d model of like the guitar player from the band wow. and like playing the music and like moving and dancing or whatever. And I heard the word in my head archetype. And hmm. I didn't really know, I, you know, you think of archetype, like before you know what that really means, you just think it's a type, you know, like the word type kind of gives it away a little bit. It's like a type of a thing. And, uh, and then I got into the band uh, Muse and they are also mushroom users. And some of their albums have this like, uh, or some of their songs have this feeling that I can't describe that's like, it feels like it's emanating from somewhere else. And like, there's also this like apocalyptic like feeling and like this urge to like leave the planet and go to space. And, uh, and I would listen to them. And then I had this realization that, uh, music comes from the subconscious mind. And so that's where I got interested and curious about the subconscious mind. And then as I explored that further, um, and then I, got deeper then it became the unconscious mind mm -hmm. and then just digging deeper because i wanted to like tap into that source of like all this really good music and uh and then yeah i smoked weed for the first time because uh my friend who's a really good drummer uh like convinced me eventually he was like yeah man weed and music they go like this <laughs> so, and yeah. uh <laughs> and so i was i was convinced and so we we smoked a blunt and then we listened to him like play drums and it was like mind blowing. And then I heard a song that had like a, a polyrhythm in it, which is basically like when like two different beats are happening at the same time that are like different speeds, but they like work together to create something. And uh, in the music, it was like listening to music went from 2D to 3D in that moment. Mm. And wow. I like had I, I like added a new dimension of perception to like music. And now yeah. 
music became this like holographic thing inside of my head. And uh, it was pretty shortly after that that I had my uh, acid experience. But yeah, it was basically like that, like being curious about the subconscious mind and then the unconscious mind. And then the very last thing that I'll say that led me to that was the I wanted to see something beautiful because I I remember when we were smoking weed, my friend um, said that he like got super, super high with his brother and that he was like seeing visuals and that he saw these like very beautiful like flower looking like visuals in his head. And then when I heard that, I was like, I want to see that like that sounds beautiful. And so then it became about like, how high can I get from weed? Like how, how much can I push this? Like, let's smoke three blunts. Let's see if I can achieve that and see something beautiful. (laughs) And then eventually you're like, how do you get more stoned? You trip. Right. (laughs) And so, yeah, Yeah. I took one hit of acid, uh, and that ended up being like not real acid. It was that in bomb stuff, which I do Mm -hmm. not recommend. Um, but basically all that happened there was like, I felt funny and, uh, I laughed at money, like as a concept. And I was like holding a dollar, just like laughing my ass off. (laughs) Like, this is so ridiculous. We make such a big deal for this little paper. (laughs) And, uh, yeah. And then I took the two hits of acid and that was like the, the real deal. So that's, Mm -hmm. yeah, that's kind of what led me down. Mm, Music. Mm -hmm. Music is magic, man. There's just something about it it's so human, you know, there's, it's just like, it is psychedelic. I mean, not all music, there's some really shitty music, but I guess really all music is psychedelic in a way because it's just so unworldly. Like, I feel like if there are alien species and they hear music, I feel like they would think that's like something that's human. I feel like it's just something Mm -hmm. That's us. Like it's it's almost like tribal in a way. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, who knows? I, I have no clue. But I feel like it's just so ingrained in in us. And really, what's the purpose of music? Would you say like a communication form, uh, like a communication of emotions through space and time? I don't know. It's like just something we like just because we like it. It's just, it just yeah. makes us. Uh, it's almost like a drug in a way. It makes us do funny yeah. things, feel different ways, and. Yeah, I don't know. It's very trippy yeah. what music is, but it's yeah. um it's psychedelic. Yeah, I agree. I've I've heard music described as a consequence free mood altering drug. Mm. I like so that. It's like it makes you feel a way that you want to feel. Yeah. Um you know and then when like, you play it and you create it, it's a whole different avenue too. That's mm-hmm. when you be when you become one with the sound, that's when you get like really almost meditative. It is very meditative yeah. when you just like you know, you know, obviously I'm preaching to the choir here, but <laughs> like, you know, when you're just jamming on a guitar and because I play a little bit, and yeah. it's just like you're so engrossed in that song. That's it. It's just you and the song. And it's like you you become the current, like you get really tapped yeah. into the flow, man. Yeah. It's like yeah. listening it, listening to it is one thing, but then playing it is a whole other thing. Yeah. Yeah, totally, totally. I, mm. I couldn't live without both, man. <laughs> Seriously, imagine life without music. It would be so lame. Yeah, no, that would, that would really suck. <laughs> yeah, right? For real. To say the least, that would suck. <laughs> we take it for granted, especially too because like how easy it is, even within the most recent years, we can access pretty much the entire library of uh, humanity's music with you know $10 a month subscription services. That's very very recent that's so revolutionary to to be able mm-hmm. to do that we don't have to go to a record store or even before that music wasn't even recorded like right. music the only time you heard music was we literally you had to find somebody that knew how to play an instrument and have them right. play it and that was how music was played for the majority of human development and civilization was like literally it was live right I mean, when was the first recording of music probably i don't know not even 100 years ago like 1940s yeah. or 50s probably I don't know. It was, it was a little bit before that. Yeah, like the tens and twenties, probably mm-hmm. like the twenties, but it didn't even sound good until maybe yeah. like the forties. <laughs> even then, you know, not everyone had the budget to record. Yeah, exactly. Like a high quality stuff. Um, but it basically is about a hundred years old and it is totally new. Like the whole idea of recorded music. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, and what's crazy too, is that it can be such a channel now for us to connect to like our ancestors, even though they're like recent ancestors, the the people are like capturing their life force into recording. That's trippy. Yeah. You know, like that's why I'm reading a book right now. Um, whoops. I'm reading this book. Um, it's called Psychedelia and Other Colors. Mm. And it's all about um, music um, and art, but they mostly focus on music, but from the 60s and how like the psychedelic current like affected bands and music and like visual artists and stuff um, between the, you know, like early 60s and the late 60s. And uh, it's just super interesting because like all of that stuff is still available to us to listen to. Yeah. And we it's can time like, travel. Yeah, exactly. We can time travel and like tap into their state of mind and yeah. like what it was like to live that, in that time. Right. Yeah. That's wild. Because yeah, if you tried to replicate Jimi Hendrix now, it wouldn't work. Mm-hmm. Like he, he had that vibe in that era and recorded it, literally put it on record in the 60s for us to listen to. And if you tried, if you could not be another Jimi Hendrix, it was, it was like, yeah, we are, we're getting like a little glimpse into Jimi Hendrix emotions in that point of time. And that not even just his emotions. Like I think what made him so great and other artists so great is they capture the emotions of millions of yeah. people that were going through this experience. And then yeah, yeah, thus we can hear it now. It is, it's time travel for sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> that and- video yeah yeah all so many different art forms can do that but i think there's definitely something uh special about music that it's the most immediate of an effect you know what i mean like yeah art, art and visuals it can like transmit that psychedelic vibe and that wavelength but for whatever reason music just like cuts the middleman and like just goes mm-hmm. straight to our heart and like we feel that like instantly mm-hmm that's what makes it so powerful. Like you kind of can't avoid it unless yeah. you're like uh, jaded or like, I don't know. You're not human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. I've heard somebody say one time, I was probably Alan Watts actually. Yeah. I think it was actually Alan Watts that when you listen to a song, it's one of the only things that we do where you don't look forward to the end. You just get yeah. so engrossed in what the actual thing is. And then it ends. You're like, Oh, I'm gonna play it again, and you get engrossed in what that is. Like even in yeah. a movie, you can say that about movie, but maybe, but there's a lot of times we're waiting for the end. Like I want to know how this ends. But in right. a song, you're never really like I want to know how this ends. No, you're just you're engrossed in whatever's right. going on. Very right. unique art form for sure. And yeah. I think it has something to do with with um, the power of sound. You know, I mean, if they say that like at first was the word, so it's like it's our essence. It's like that. It's the how do I put this? It's like the prime energy. It's the energy of energies. Right. Like sound came before everything. So in order, right? like why we're so engrossed in sound rather than visuals is because it's like, it's, that's the essence. Like that's the right. closest thing we're going to get to Jimi Hendrix and how he felt <laughs> when he was watching, um, when he was writing all along the watchtower. Like we're getting yeah. that almost like literally from his lungs, from his vocal cords, through the mic, but through a computer back into us we get literally Jimi hendrix in our ears and like it's not the same as if we saw him like if you just see a picture of him it's not the same i don't know how it isn't but like sound is so at our core i think that's Mm -hmm. why it resonates with us yeah well they say the universe is vibration right yeah sound is all vibratory exactly and even light is to an extent but it just registers as a different sense yeah i feel like uh sound is the vibration that you can feel it's like the tangible uh super tangible one uh yeah the sound definitely has an esoteric side to it man and that's why like i always love listening to music when i trip i almost rarely do it without it i know the the terrence mckenna prescription is uh five grams in silent darkness yeah i I, uh but even if you do it like there is no true silence you know what i mean Mm. like terrence talked about it like how your your hallucinations are 
they're like spinning off of what your sensory inputs are already getting. So if you cut that off, your brain is going to take the tiniest like little sounds or whatever and like spin off of that. So like if you're in complete silence, there's going to be some kind of like buzz or hum or like oscillation of like yeah. the air conditioning or your fan or whatever. And like whatever rhythm is in that, your brain is going to like hallucinate off of that. So it's like, um there's no true like silence unless you get one of those special rooms but um yeah i love i love to listen to music tripping just because of how powerful it it can like uh how powerfully it can affect the hallucinations like to me that's the most interesting thing about all of this stuff yeah man yeah do you think that we're just not aware of what these because you said that uh like our fan or air conditioner would affect the trip right we become one with the air conditioner flow do you think that these sounds are always doing that and the psychedelics allow us to just become aware of these vibrations around us or it actually does open up something you know um i think it is always kind of doing that because i notice it in other states of mind too where um but I don't know because I'm thinking about like uh, about weed where like uh, I'll like sometimes hear music in my head and then I'll notice that the rhythm is actually coming from like the, the fan like making that ticking sound and it's like my brain's building a whole like symphony off of that and 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 like you said it's like we just notice it so I think that it is always happening and that uh, the psychedelics are just uh, allowing us to tune in or to be sensitized to it. It's like mm-hmm. we 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 shut stuff like that out because it doesn't have any like practical purpose for us. Like our 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 baseline state of mind, we need to be able to hear like the tiger roaring, so we know to like jet out yeah. of here. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think that's what it is. It's like a shift into a non like survival only state of mind and then Mm -hmm. that's one of the things that happens is like we allow more information in and we can get like entranced by stuff and and notice it and uh, Mm -hmm. so it's still a mystery i'm not saying i know like completely what's going on but that's that's my personal take is that it is always kind of there in that we're just like uh more sensitive to it yeah makes sense i agree and ultimately what it shows us is that we're connected to our environment and other people in our environment, everything around us, we're truly connected. Even if we're not aware that we're connected, there is that connection of essentially vibration that we share. We're just, there's, there's no difference between the vibration of the sounds around us and what we are. It's all just this one, ultimately it's this one current of just many currents of vibration but ultimately we're just this giant current just waves just flowing against each other and just combining and interrelating with each other that's i think the bigger picture of what psychedelics show us and extending that a little bit it shows us how you know we're all related as human beings and how we affect each other energetically and physically as well um that's the most important thing then is like how do these things how how do these things show us how our actions um, affect others in the world? Um, that's that's the juice, you know, <laughs> of what we need of what these things show us. Because I mean, when I I remember taking, I think it was a mushroom trip. I felt somehow somehow some way, and it sounds crazy to say, but I felt interrelated with every single human being on Earth at that moment. Like somehow I felt. And I felt it was it was tough because I felt the suffering of everybody because everyone's we're going through the you know we're all going through the struggle. So in that one moment, I felt just all coming in. It's just like it hit me right in my heart. I was like oh, and I just it was just like something that just opened up in my heart. And I think we're always connected at that level. We're actually always telepathically connected to all the billions of people on Earth. Like there is this. Um, there is this, uh, what is that called? The uh, collect was the collective unconscious and there yeah. really is. But if we were open to that at all points, it's almost like our brain shields us from the truth. Like it, it just so we can survive, like you said, so we can hear the yeah. tiger, right? But yeah. the tiger might be something else. It might be like our bills or, you know, somebody right. cutting us off in traffic or something like that. <laughs> but our brain shuts us off from the ultimate truth, which is our 
constant inter interconnectivity in telepathy with other beings so that we can, you know, be just here so we can actually yeah. survive. But I think, yeah, the truth is that we are constantly interconnected and interrelated at all points and all times. And we always will be, and we always are. Um, mm. And that's, that's tough, man. That's a, that's a tough, tough pill to swallow. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I think that kind of gives us a purpose too. It's like until yeah. we're all like healed and we can reduce the suffering as much as possible, then uh, we still got work to do. Exactly. You know? And, and treating it like as if it's ourself and treating exactly. it not only the humans but the uh the earth that we live on mm -hmm. and uh yeah it's like uh you know you may be like a chronic litterer and then you trip and then you think about it when you're tripping and you're like oh wait this is me that i'm i'm like hitting myself in the head with a hammer right now mm -hmm. and you don't even realize it because we've been conditioned to think that we are these separate entities and uh yeah, that's like the Aldous Huxley idea of consciousness being a reduction valve that like the the interconnected state and the psychedelic state is actually what our brain is like capable of at all times and like doing. But for the sake of survival, it's like constricted to this tiny little funnel to just to allow enough in to where we don't get overwhelmed. And yeah. I think there's a purpose for that and there's a value for that. But we got to, uh, you know, uh, temper that with these other states of mind, you know, on occasional. Yeah. Remind events. yourself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Remind yourself. It's funny how that's actually, how that's uh, spelt. We have to remind yeah. ourselves. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> nice. Nice. It's true because we're really, I mean, the popular um, paradigm that we're under right now, the spell is of the ego of the self is that just, just me, 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 me. But in actuality, yeah. me is you. You and me are really the self. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's not that we go completely into La La Land and Kumbaya, all is the self, all is good, we're in heaven. No, we're not quite there yet. Uh, maybe someday we'll be in some state like that. But yeah. we, ha we have to live with the separate self of me being Gary, you being Tyler, wherever the listener is, knowing that they're the separate self. But also at the same time, somehow we're interrelated. So if you can live with that, the dance between the two, the two poles, find the middle ground between them two. Don't get sucked into either one. Yeah. That's that's the doubt. That's the flow. Is we if we can be on that wavelength of of I have a job to do here and the job may be to make the place that I live in a little bit of a better place for others that are also myself that's how i kind of see that you know we yeah, see that right. you're, you're you're the self well you see that yourself is in others so what else am i going to do from here i'm going to serve i'm going to serve everybody else and i'm going to serve the earth to make it better for myself as above so below you know i can i think it, it goes back like that it's like you can what you do for yourself your body self your separate self which you think is separate is actually it's the you're actually helping others the other self you know it's mm -hmm. like you, you're helping yourself but you're helping the other selves that are actually just yourself <laughs> right <laughs> right if that made sense but, yeah, yeah i think it, it would make sense if you've already experienced that it might not make sense to someone who has never uh felt their individuality dissolve into a larger whole yeah but I get what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the gist of this whole psychedelic experience, right? It's to know that, well, it's to figure out what we are. So then it's like, all right, well, what are we? Well, I can't exactly explain to you what we are, but what we are is all the same thing. It's all the same mechanism. So you can come to that conclusion. Okay. All is one and one is all. Now what? Now what do we do? Well, mm -hmm. we take refuge in that idea and we serve others. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, I guess... You find out how to serve others. I mean, I can't tell anybody how to serve. But we're all good at what we're good at. We all have yeah. our dharma here, as they call it. So just find that out yourself. Keep asking the question. But ultimately, I think it's just about service, just selfless service to others. 
And from there, life becomes a flow. And you don't might not even need psychedelics after that. Psychedelics just might be the message. And once you get the message, hang up the phone, as Alan Watts says. Um, I think that's true too. I think maybe, you know, once you get on that wavelength of knowing what you got to do here as a human being in this short life and the short movie as a human being, then you just flow with that and you go with that. And um, life becomes the trip. Life becomes psychedelic. And uh, yeah, that's the, that's the purpose, man. We're, we're supposed to do something here. I think that's what these things can also show you is that we're supposed to be, of um some kind of action here even if you do yeah. nothing you're doing something like even if you're you're just sitting in your room you're sitting in your room you know what i'm trying to say so you have to do something here so i think using psychedelics effectively or meditation and yoga whatever your practice is to know what you are ultimately it'll bring you to a point of action and it'll bring you in that in that action is actually happiness and peace I find in that action is a, a sense of just going with the flow of life. And no matter, you know, you're going to, shit's going to happen in your life and stuff's going to come up, but you still know that um, you have a purpose. Cause I think that's what we're all lacking. We're all lacking a true purpose, a divine purpose, because we're all given a purpose. Maybe a, you're an accountant or a carpenter or a doctor or what, maybe that actually is your purpose, but maybe it's not, maybe that's not actually your divine purpose. Well, going through and having that self inquiry will allow you to find that divine purpose to be aligned and create with some may say God. Some may say the divine, the, the the supreme, the totality, but there's something going on here, man. You know, psychedelics will show you that, that there's, there's, there's something going on here. This isn't just like a random arrangement of atoms that just so happen to become human. And here we are, we're just, it's a free for all. We're just doing nothing. It's just like a, you know, nothing matters. Like, no, 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 no. Where there's something that you have to do here, man. And you can ignore it all you want, but that's just going to cause you suffering. So you either find out now, and um, you look deep within with earnest, uh, with an earnest respect toward yourself in a genuine curiosity, and you figure it out and you get on that wavelength, or you just keep suffering. You know what I'm getting at? Like, you, I think truly finding happiness in life, which is what it's all about, man. I think we're supposed to enjoy this life, is finding out why you're here and what we're doing here. And um, I think we're all capable of it. I really do. I think, I think if you're born, if you're born a human being, you're an asset of the divine. Like you're a tool. You're a creator of the creator. Just by default. I can feel that within myself and I'm nobody. So if I can feel that within myself, then I think anybody can feel that within themselves. But you got to tap mm -hmm. in. You have to tap in. That's the most important thing. You have to do it. Nobody's going to do it. This podcast isn't going to do it for anybody. If anybody's listening this long and uh, Alan Watts isn't going to do it, Terrence McKenna, there's no video out there. There's no TikTok. And there's nothing else that's going to do it except like you that has an earnest, a very earnest, earnest and genuine curiosity for what you are and what you're doing here. And uh, yeah, end of my rant. That's all I got to say about wow. that. <laughs> yeah, well, applause for that one, man. Yeah, Thanks, man. I, think... I don't know where that came from, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. you just tapped in, man. That's what tapped it was. In. You tapped into the flow. Tapped uh, in. <laughs> I think there's definitely a lot of wisdom in your words, man. And I think that that sense of divine purpose is something that a lot of people could use right now because that's kind of not the uh, advice that you would get from somebody in our culture being like, all right, you need to get a job. You need it, which obviously we have to survive and there are practical ways to do that. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, it doesn't mean disregard that at all. Yeah. That's right. not what I'm saying either. It's like you have right. to still play the game. But then having that sense of purpose in the back of your head gives you a little more, a uh, little more gumption for living, a little more, yeah, right. You know, a little more than just the grind of life, I guess you could right. say. It could be the difference of someone, you know, thinking about ending their own life versus not, you know what Yo, I mean? That's real, man. That's real. I feel that because I, I had that, man. I had suicidal feelings. I didn't have tendencies, but I had suicidal feelings before psychedelics. And I didn't have a purpose. Like, I just felt like I was, I had this like shitty ass job that I didn't like. I was just going for money and didn't feel fulfilled. Well, uh, the mushrooms and this whole wavelength of psychedelia allowed me to tap in and never feel that way ever again. Yep. Like never, I know, I don't even think about it at all, but right. before, before the mushrooms, I didn't, I didn't have that glimpse. I didn't have that ability to see that the brighter side of life, even through all the shit and the struggle, like I still go through it. We all, we're all going through it, but I can see no matter through that struggle, there is a, 
there is a purpose for me here. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's what we need, man. So true. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had a similar experience. Like I'm super thankful for the fact that when I was 18 and I had that acid trip, part of it was, you know, as soon as the energy of the Kundalini was like within me, I felt immediately that I had to express it. And it was all like related to the chakras too. It was like this love that I felt in my heart center it was so powerful that I felt like I had to express it and that that became my divine purpose in that moment. And I've Mm -hmm. never let go of that. Mm -hmm. I've always felt like, how can you? Yeah. (laughs) It was like, so, and, and there's the noetic quality of these experiences too, where it feels like there's like an authority to it, that it's not just like something you think, Oh, I think this is my purpose. It's like, Mm. boom, like you get the download and it's super clear. And uh, I have some friends that, um, you know, they haven't found that for themselves yet. And I think psychedelics can be the way to do that, um, especially if you go in with that intention. Me, I didn't have that intention, but it did happen. Mm-hmm. And like I have a friend who's uh, trying to find a good time to take a heroic dose of mushrooms because they're like going through an existential crisis kind of thing. And Damn. they feel pulled like um, by like their parents to like go in one direction um and but then there's something within them that's like i need to find that like real purpose you know yeah. that's like connected to that that current and so they're gonna take mushrooms pretty soon and like i think that's one of the most beautiful things that you can probably do with psychedelics and i i believe that they do deliver on that purpose right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. i agree man i agree what more do you want than a purpose for, for being, for living? Yeah. And it really just comes down to living in love. I mean, everybody has their purpose of how we, how we bring about that in action and what we do here and how we serve with these hands and this, and this brain. But it really just comes down to what am I good at? What, what God-given abilities was I good at? And how can I use these God-given abilities and in my circumstances of life to better not only my life, but thus others in, in that, um, in that action of bettering my life, you know, in also doing what I like and doing what I'm good at, how can I find that flow and better the world? And it's really that simple and definitely easier said than done to find that because I don't think it's easy. I mean, I don't even know. I think I have my purpose that I'm living in yeah, I know I'm living in love, but I, I can feel when I'm not living in love, when I'm doing it, something that's outside of my purpose, when I'm like doing something that totally does not relate, or I'm just living in the lower energies and the lower chakras, yeah. just trying to satisfy my wants. I can feel that. And you can't, you can't get off that wavelength. I feel like once you realize this um, and you get aligned with, I guess you could say your inner guru or your thought adjuster or your higher self, some may say, it's like you're you you'll get easily um, put back in line by that by that higher guidance. Um, yeah, and it might not even be very pretty, but when, once you you know if you fall off the beaten path, you'll get um what's the word I'm looking for? You'll get easily checked. You know what I mean? So there's no going back. Once you take the red pill, there's honestly no going back. But I wouldn't want it any other way. You know, that's not to scare anybody into this thing because I've, I've heard this a lot too. Like a lot of people say they don't want enlightenment or they don't want to be awakened. I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. I feel like everybody should want that truly deep down. That's really just the ego saying that. It's just, it's like people's egos that doesn't, that don't want to die. But truly, I think deep down, everybody should want this enlightenment of their purpose in life and what we're here for and that glimpse into the uh the sense of their being because that like i said is happiness but have you ever heard that before like people say they don't want to be awakened they, and they don't want this enlightenment or a kundalini awakening um not really but i also haven't pressed anybody on it uh i <laughs> i mean i get i get the general idea that some people aren't as like excited about exploring it um but then there's also i think there's some people need to come to it on their own you know what i mean like uh even if you try to convince someone that it is the right thing to do 
it needs to be their own idea. Yeah, they have a to lot of the time, themselves. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you can just kind of be an example, and like everyone's a, on a different part of their path, and like not everyone has the same catalyst that that uh, you know. Not everyone has the same catalyst as everyone else, so mm-hmm. it's just such a different circumstance. But like I, I've noticed friends that like it, it took them like. 10 years to like be interested in exploring themselves and like to, to know themselves in a, like a very profound way. And like, you can't, you couldn't convince them to do that before, but then they came to it on their own. It took them a lot longer, but they did. And uh, so I just, I guess that's how I approach it is like, even if they say that now, maybe somewhere down the line, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll come around. Mm -hmm. because I think one can realize that there's no other way. I think eventually you get to a point where it's like, okay, well, after trials and tribulations that I've been through, there has to be another way to see this. There has to be another way to live. And there is, there is another way, thankfully. So I think really our struggle and our suffering is what brings us to that. And that's an old yogic belief. You know, our property brings us to Purusha. It's an old saying that you know yeah this is this is an illusion maya this is the struggle this is samsara i guess you could say but you have to use that samsara to bring you to nirvana and i think that's a that's how a lot of people get on the wavelength of awakening it's just that you can't deal with the conditioning anymore you can't deal with uh going with uh, everybody else going with the crowd and you have to find what happiness truly is because like i said man i think we're all meant to be happy here Truly, I really do think this that's kind of the purpose of life. I know that sounds extremely cliche, but I think it's cliche for a reason because I think we're all supposed to be, we're, we're supposed to enjoy this experience through the darkness. So I think the darkness is what leads you to the light. You can only put up with so much darkness, but you need the darkness in order to have the light. So I think for a lot of people's experience, that's what brings it, uh, brings them to at least try to find the light within themselves. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Some people like haven't gotten to rock bottom yet and that's kind of where you need to go or it doesn't even have to be rock, absolute rock bottom, but going through something, you know, whether it's traumatic or uh, depression or whatever, a lot of that is Mm -hmm. the break, the tipping point where it, it leads you to that. And like my journey was really interesting because I feel like I had a really good, easy childhood, not really full of, you know, anything that negative, but then I had the experience and then it's like, I got the experience first and then like life just put me through all this stuff, you know, after these experiences and it's been piecing that all together. And, uh, you mean a psychedelic experience or like a struggle experience? Yeah, like uh, after the psychedelic experience, then I went through the struggle as opposed to like some rough part of my life, like leading me to that. It was like kind of the opposite. It was like I got the taste and then now I have to go through the whole like the journey, you know, the dark night of the soul. Yeah. And uh, and mm. then come back to it. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's different for everybody. Um, but. Yeah, I think like what you said earlier, curiosity is what it boils down to, and uh, and then another thing you said earlier is earlier is like how we're living in light of the mystery, and how even if we don't solve that, I think that just knowing that we have a clue that there's a mystery that that's the answer. So yeah, that's, exactly. That's kind of the thing I've been living by. Um, yeah, I like that. Hmm. I like that a lot. That's the answer. The answer is the mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like wow. once you know, once you have a clue that there is a mystery, in a way you've already found the answer. Yeah. That doesn't mean stop looking, but that's the whole idea of the mystery is that it's something to it's like an endless game, an endless thing to pursue. Mm-hmm. And it's to me that's more interesting. I mean, wouldn't it be kind of boring if we knew everything about the universe and existence <laughs> and we were like, yeah, you know, this and this happened, some stars blew up and now we're here. And it's like, we do have some knowledge, but like at, 
at the deepest level, everything is a mystery. Like, yeah. why, why is there something instead of nothing? I have no <laughs> idea. Why was I born instead? Of, or like when you think about what was life like before you were born? Can it, you, there's just like nothing there. So it's like, yeah, just stuff like that. Like I think uh, Terrence McKenna said like, uh, we're our our life is a a mystery suspended between two eternities or something like you know before you're born is an eternity when you're alive it's a mystery and mm. then after you're born is another eternity so we're just like this it's just this huge incomprehensible thing yeah that man our existence is wow i like that between two eternities damn yeah, and there's a lot of theories about that. Some may say we reincarnate and there, there's really no before. It's really just a continuation. And there's no after. It's really just a continuation of energy. Some may say we go to a heavenly abode. Some may say we also do reincarnate in a heavenly abode and then we come back to Earth. There's a lot of different stories, but ultimately, nobody knows. Nobody knows why we're here. Yeah. Nobody knows where we're going. Nobody knows where we came from. And there's a lot of very articulate explanations that you may read in a book or you might hear from other speakers but ultimately if they're a human being they probably don't know (laughs) they have no idea man but that's what i live for it's like don't get scared of the mystery because i think a lot of people are turned off by the mystery and they get scared of it understandably so but disconcerting yeah i mean understandable i mean that's that can lead to like a psychotic break honestly but i don't think there's anything i think it's safe i think the mystery is safe if that makes sense i think ultimately there is a mystery but i think also behind the scenes there is some kind of order like you can tap into that like uh ooh, i don't know it's like this that that love that we talked about before you can tap into that and it almost feels like you're guided by that love and to know yeah. that everything's gonna be okay even if you feel like it's not okay and we're in this mystery and like what the hell's going on bro seriously ultimately i think behind the scenes that's okay it's okay to not be okay um and I think that's huge as well to be able to tap into that. So also like revere the mystery, but also revere that the mystery is just a game. Like there, we're in this game and ultimately the truth of it is we're all player one playing this game. And that's really where we're safe. Ultimately, the truth is that no matter what, there is a mystery, but really there isn't a mystery, if that makes sense. Like there, it's really all, it's all good. And it's all just one flowing current that we're just caught in. But the mystery is for us. It's it's the game for us to wake up to the mystery. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. I get what you're saying. Yeah, that there is some some sense of like uh, a higher purpose or a higher like plot line, I guess, that we're following. Even though, yeah, yeah it's kind of it's like destiny or something. Like, yeah, but yeah, we are destined to pursue the mystery. And exactly. There, there's certain <laughs> there's certainty in that, and then. Yeah. yeah, there could be like what you're saying, like this this loving presence that you feel like we don't know what that that's part of the mystery, too. And it's the one taking care of you and like uh, and giving you that reassurance and like that purpose that we're, you know, all craving. And well, do uh, you ever use the word God when you speak about these things or do you use other terms? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. I'm, I'm one of the people who's like a little bit reluctant to use that, but sometimes I do. Um, it really just depends. I don't like, like using it willy nilly. Um, but I prefer like, um, like source or like Mm -hmm. something kind of like that. But, and, and sometimes I will say like, yeah, I, I saw like, god but it's not like to me the word is too tied up with like uh the old idea dogma of of it Mm -hmm. like you know a a sky dad yeah (laughs) um and i definitely don't you know subscribe to that anymore but like um yeah i kind of as long as people know what i'm talking about then yeah but um yeah i i prefer like source and and stuff like that kind of yeah, I know what you mean. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just got to know what the, you got to know the audience, I guess you could say. Yeah, <laughs> right. It all yeah. it all changes. Yeah, God can mean a lot of things. That's another thing I felt when I uh, did mushrooms, a uh, really big dose for the first time. I was like, oh, I understand what God means, and I don't. It doesn't mean like what other people have told me my whole life. 
I understand how somebody could feel God now. Like I felt like that presence and I was also reluctant to use it, but I think that's the ultimate true meaning of God. Like when in all these scriptures and old holy books, I really think they were just describing kind of what we're talking about, the source, this, this loving spirit. That's the true meaning of God, not the sky daddy with the puppet strings. I think that's kind of a uh, distortion on the word, but words really don't do any justice. It really doesn't matter what word you use, but definitely. Yeah. I, I know what you mean. God is, is heavily distorted in our, our view. And a lot of people think it's like this tyrannical force that is uh, omnipresent that dictates how we live and judges us and makes us feel guilty. And it's not like that, man. It's not, it's a God of love, not of fear. You know, it's not of guiltiness of, it's not a, it's not like, uh, it's not like the big daddy God, you know, always watching us like, uh, like the big brother, you know, it's not yeah. like that. It's more of this loving guidance. It's this like best friend that you could be friends. It's, it's this force. It's this, uh, this wavelength, this energy that you can become one with, um, and then create with, and it is like a guidance. It's this like, it's this helper. It's this, uh, I don't know how else to explain it, but it's like a part of us. And it's not something that's separate from us. That it's like a King figure. It's not like that at all. It's just, yeah. it's this energy. And it's the yeah. energy of love. Ultimately. Yeah, man. Dude, you're making me want to trip so bad right now. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it right now. I want to Let's tap in, mushrooms. man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But uh, yeah, man. Um, I don't know what else to say after that one. You got anything to say? You got any last words for the people? Um, no, I think I pretty much said what I, I needed to say. Just that uh, if there's anyone, you know, going through a crisis of purpose, that I would encourage you not to give up on that and to mm. just keep searching. And I think there's a lot of like spiritual and practical ways that you can achieve that, that I think we kind of touched on, like, like what you said, Gary, like find what you're good at and use that to serve other people. And even if life doesn't let you do that all the time, mm. if you do at least some of that, yeah. that's going to be an incremental, like uh increase of your like fulfillment uh, that will, could be the difference of you wanting to live or not, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and like, you know, we're all going through it, you know, like, I feel like I'm not able to do the things that feel aligned with my purpose at all times, but because I get to do it at least some, my life is better for that. And, uh, yeah, just keep going. Don't, don't give up. It's, it's a long lifelong game to play. Mm -hmm. Some may say multi lifelong game to yeah. play, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I agree, man. Well said. We all have a purpose here. Every single one of us has a purpose. And it goes beyond our bank account. It goes beyond our followers. You know, it goes beyond our subscribers. There's a greater purpose for why we're all here incarnated as a human being in this moment. Um, but only you can find that out yourself. Yeah. Uh, only you can save you, man. Um, truly. Yeah. Other than that, man, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, thank you for coming on. Thanks for anybody that listened this long and peace out. Namaste. Absolutely. Peace, man.